Stanford University. So now introducing uh, tonight's speaker, Tom Kurtamos. Um, Tom uh, went, did his uh, bachelor's degree at Grinnell College in Iowa, and then moved to the University of Chicago, where he did a master's in biophysics and theoretical biology. And if we have time tonight, maybe I'll ask him what the theoretical biology is. Um, that's what some of the reviewers on my, on my NIH grants uh, sometimes mm -hmm. proposal is more theoretical than real. Uh, he then went to the University of Chicago Medical School, where he received his MD degree, uh, internship and residency there, and then a clinical and research fellow in medicine at Harvard University in Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, Tom then uh, served as an assistant professor at Harvard and then uh, was recruited to Vanderbilt uh, where he served as director of the Division of Cardiology um, <clears throat> from 1991 until 1997 when we were fortunate enough to recruit Tom to Stanford uh, where he uh, came as division director of adult cardiology. Um, Tom has received multiple, multiple honors and awards. Um, most importantly, he was the director of the prestigious uh, Reynolds Cardiovascular Clinical Research Center um, uh, from 2000 to 2005, uh, a very competitive competition for uh, clinical research, clinical basic science translation of research centers from the American Heart Association. Um, and he is the William Irwin Chair in Medicine at uh, Stanford. Um, <clears throat> Tom is on the editorial boards of multiple journals, including Circulation and Molecular and Cellular Cardiology. Um, he has published um, upwards of 200 scientific publications. I don't have the exact number because you sent me an old copy of your CV. Um, but his work has focused in, in, in a lot of different areas. One is basically vascular biology and understanding uh, the mechanisms by which blood vessels grow and develop, uh, as well as those mechanisms by which they develop disease. Um, he has uh, worked on an interesting molecule that Dr. Ashley um, and I have also helped him with uh, called apolin, which is a novel um, uh, protein that was first discovered uh, by Tom's group um, in patients who were recovering from heart failure. Um, and more recently has had a, um, again, I guess beginning with the Reynolds Center, has um, been um, at the forefront of using some of the modern techniques of large scale, large population genomics to answer some basic questions about why people get cardiovascular disease and how to define the risk. So I think a couple of weeks ago, someone asked about 23andMe and, you know, should I should I sign up and have them do my blood? And I think uh, Tom will give you a little bit of a view of some of the, the tools that a real genomics um, evaluation can, can give us and, and can't give us. And some of the population uh, groups that he studied um, include uh, part participants in groups as large as, uh, I think, 200,000 in, in one of the population groups. So when one talks about really doing meaningful research and understanding the role of genes in populations, uh, there's no one better to talk to you about that than Tom Kurtamos. Okay, so, uh, so ischemic heart disease. And so I want to begin a dialogue and uh, tell you what's known uh, about the uh, pathophysiology of this disease process. We'll talk about the epidemiology of this disease process and what has come before now. And then we'll proceed to talk a little bit about the modern genetics, the modern genetic tools that we've been using and then I'll bring you up to speed on probably the greatest uh, breakthrough that's happened in the past uh, five or six decades, really, in relationship to ischemic heart disease. And, and it's, uh, it's been also uh, associated with a series of breakthroughs in, in looking at a number of complex human diseases. So I think this is a very exciting time. I've waited my entire career for the last few years of the research that we've been doing as the technologies become available. So I want to share with you some of the excitement uh, and, uh, that, that, we, that we feel now and some of the opportunities that, that we have that we never had. And so we've been, in my career, which is a long, long time now, I've been rehearsing, getting ready for the last few years where we've really begun to, to have uh, tools and have leads that allow us to make uh, significant fundamental research. So is ischemic coronary heart disease important? Well, 
looking here, this is old data, this is 2000, but the data hasn't changed that much. If you look at the leading causes of death for white males and females, it's number one, it's number one uh, for both, uh, both genders. So very important, very important disease. And we'll talk about this more, but as um, we've actually done a great job over the last decade of decreasing the, uh, the mortality from coronary heart disease, but, uh, and we've also decreased the, the incidence of coronary heart disease, but as we'll discuss later, that's all going to change. It's going to get much worse in the coming few years, and the curves are gonna go back up in terms of the incidence and complications from ischemic heart disease. So, you're all the doctors now, and so I'm gonna to present to you two patients who are coming into your clinic, and I'm gonna ask you sort of what you think about those two patients and how you would manage them. Patient number one, initials are WC, 65-year-old man, otherwise healthy, but no prior known coronary heart disease. High, very high job stress, so he must have lived in the Bay Area. He's a, he's a little bit overweight. I mean, not, not terribly obese, but, but overweight. He's a little bit hypertensive, and he smokes a little bit, smokes cigars, actually. His father died of a stroke. He has a very sedentary lifestyle. He doesn't exercise at all. Um, he drinks alcohol and uh, a little bit to mo moderation, I guess. We don't really know much about his other risk factors. He clearly wasn't diabetic, but we don't really have uh, an accurate cholesterol measurement. Second patient is JF, 52 years old. Uh, a man, healthy, apparently healthy. Uh, he's an avid runner. Actually wrote a book about running. He, uh, his cholesterol was around 240, total cholesterol. And what we know of his family history was that his father died of heart disease at an early age. So if, which of these two patients would you be thinking, would you be worried about, I guess, if you all were sitting in the doctor's office and saw the, and Is JF Jim <laughs> So, I mean, you know, you guys, I'm obviously presenting these two cases for a reason, and you're thinking, it's gotta be this guy, right? Because otherwise <laughs> I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be, you know, presenting these two people to you. But there's a point, there's a method to my madness, and here they are. <laughs> so Winston Churchill, of course, you know, he did everything wrong, and he died in his 80s, and we're not sure exactly how he died, but he had a, he had a full life and a very good life. And then Jim Fix, of course, uh, who wrote the complete book of running, died at age 52, uh, running in Vermont, actually, was found at the roadside. Um, and so I think that clearly our understanding of classical risk factors does not tell us the whole story. And so we've been mired up, you know, in, in classical risk factors and trying to understand the complete risk for a long time. But we've got to know what's the, what are the missing variables here? That, that, that can we identify these and can we do a better job of, uh, of identifying risk? So here's a, a brief outline, coronary heart disease. We're talking about the disease, what we know and treat, the risk factors, risk we can identify and, and we can identify and can't treat, and primarily that's genetics. What is genetics? What can it teach us? And what are we doing now to learn about this type of risk? I think those are the issues I wanna cover. So I'll stop in a little bit and we'll have some questions and we'll go on and then we'll stop and then we'll have some more questions and then we'll go on. And so we'll try and do this in around three parts. So first we're gonna talk a bit about the disease. So I really want this to be a dialogue today and so I want you guys to ask me some tough questions and uh, we can go as complicated as you wanna go, you know, uh, or as uncomplicated as you wanna go. So it's up to you all. So here it is, here's the heart, this is the, the pump that pr pr provides blood and oxygen and nutrients to the rest of the body. And uh, I won't go into all the details, but, but uh, blood comes in from the periphery, you know, goes through the right side of the heart, then comes out and goes to the lungs. It gains oxygen in the lungs, comes back to the left side of the heart, and then goes out to the uh, systemic circulation. These blood vessels here, which are on the surface of the heart, are the coronary arteries, okay? And so when people talk about have a coronary, they're talking about having a disease in this circulation. And so although blood goes through the pumping chambers of the heart, the heart muscle itself doesn't gain much oxygen or nutrients from that process. It's really these blood vessels that course over the top of the, uh, of the heart you know, and penetrate into the heart and bifurcate, trifurcate, and pr provide the hardworking muscle with the oxygen and nutrients that are needed uh, to, uh, to keep it going. And so, uh, so this is a pretty normal uh, individual in, in the Western civilized world. And, and so this, you can see this coronary artery is a nice open lumen. 
Over here, we can see that there's disease process in this person's coronary artery, proximal coronary artery, and, and a large portion of the, the lumen is, is blocked here by this, uh, by this atheroma or, uh, or atherosclerosis. Now, this person uh, has a lot of disease, and you can see now that the lumen is almost completely gone. All that remains is this little, this little sliver of lumen here, and so this is really all the blood you know, uh, for this large coronary artery has to go through this small, small lumen. And uh, we'll come back to your questions in just a minute. And, um, and so you can imagine this person, if, you're running, if he's running through the airport carrying two bags, this heart is not going to get enough oxygen. Uh, there's not going to be enough blood flowing through this, through this obstruction to provide uh, enough oxygen for that heart. And so you can imagine a couple of platelets sticking here on this surface of this region, and, and you can have a clot form pretty quickly. So this is the disease process. It's no more complicated than that. It's a plumbing problem. It's a very complicated plumbing problem, but it's a plumbing problem. So the disease begins uh, early in life, and so there have been lots of studies uh, looking at uh, infantry men who've died in wars, you know, younger individuals in their late 20s and 30s, and you can already begin to see the disease process in those individuals you begin to see the inner surface of the blood vessel raise up, and there begin to accumulate cells and fat deposits underneath the, uh, the lining surface of the, of the uh, blood vessel. And this continues to get worse, and there are more cells, and there's more fat that gets deposited into the, uh, into the intima, into this region here uh, of the uh, blood vessel. And this yellow area here is fat, and that goes, and that process continues. And there's a, the risk that we really have when this happens is that there will be a rupture and that the gooey contents inside the vessel wall will actually be released into the blood vessel wall and they will initiate a, a clot formation. And that clot will then completely occlude the vessel and will stop all flow of blood through this. And that will produce a myocardial infarction. Some people escape this process and go on to have uh, an organized, uh, 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 contained region of atheroma in the blood vessel wall. And these people come in and say, you know, the last couple of months I've been walking to, when I walk to the mailbox, I have a little bit of pain. You know, I never had that before, and it seems to be getting worse over the past couple of months. And so this person comes in, is very fortunate because we can address this problem here. It's obviously much harder to address this difficulty here in the context of a rupture, a, a total occlusion of the uh, blood vessel and, and an acute myocardial infarction. So that's sort of the pathophysiology of the disease. Fat buildup, fat deposition in the blood vessel wall, lots of cells, inflammatory components are involved in that process. And so here's a heart um, you know, where a myocardial infarction has occurred. And so this is a cross section through both ventricles. And you can see this dark region here is, is the infarct itself. So these cells, these myocardial cells, which normally function to help contract and pull, pull the ventricle together to move the blood, these guys are all dead now. And so they're going to be slowly resorbed, and they're going to be replaced by fibrous tissue. Uh, and this region of the heart is going to be non-functional going forward. It's just not going to be able to contract any longer. And, and so many people survive you know, having, having lost a significant portion of their ventricular capacity or their, you know, their, their left ventricular function, but, but there are problems that come along with you losing this much um, tissue from your heart. You have uh, abnormal rhythms. You have congestive heart failure in some cases, so it's difficult. Um, some, some individuals do last for a long time after they've had a myocardial infarction if they receive a lot of attention and they don't have recurrent myocardial infarctions. And the complications of the, of the damage to the tissue are, are taken care of by, by a skilled cardiologist. And I know you've heard about arrhythmias which come from this kind of tissue damage. So risk factors, um, going back in history again, um, the world, the United States and the world became interested in risk factors around the time uh, that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was, was in the White House and he had severe, severe hypertension and had strokes. And so uh, Congress uh, appropriated a lot of money to establish longitudinal studies. At that point in time, risk factors were really not, cardiovascular risk factors were not understood, not appreciated. And so this kind of longitudinal study was, okay, let's collect a bunch of people, let's measure a bunch of things, and then let's just see what happens, right? And let's see if we can correlate those variables 
that we measured before the event with whether or not they have an event and how severe the event was, et cetera, right? So a lot, this is a classical longitudinal epidemiology study design. So observational study, you've all heard the Framingham Heart Study where uh, many, many uh, residents of the town of Framingham in Massachusetts were enrolled in this study and they were, many things were measured, blood, you know, blood studies, uh, uh, blood pressure, you know, all, all sorts of things were measured. The Honolulu Heart Study, a classic study, went on in, in, in Hawaii. As I said, many parameters were measured, subjects were followed and compared, and population risk factors were identified. And this was an amazing uh, step forward for this field. 1948, started the Framingham Heart Study. 1960, cigarette smoking found to increase the risk of heart disease. 1961, cholesterol level, blood pressure, and electrocardiogram abnormalities were found to increase the risk of heart disease. 1967, 1967, physical activity found to reduce the risk of heart disease and obesity to increase the risk of heart disease. So we'll come back to this in a minute. I mean, we didn't understand what that meant at the time, but 1967, and we really need to pay attention to this finding today more than ever. So here are the risk factors and the, and the, the current therapies that, that uh, are available. Uh, there are more therapies all the time. Uh, you know, what's important to realize, though, is that if you take all of the best therapies for all of the appropriate risk factors, you can only reduce cardiovascular events in a population by about 30%. 30%. So that leaves 70% of myocardial infarctions un attended, unimpacted un by very careful uh, control of, of these classical risk factors. So we have a lot to do. We have a lot to, to understand and a lot to work on. So, um, so this is another blood vessel wall, very similar to the one I showed you before. And I want to use it to make the point that what we don't understand is all of the risk factors most of the risk factors. Diabetes, you know, is an elevation of glucose in the blood and really is not, is not part of the process on the blood vessel wall, right? Hyperlipidemia, you know, contributes to this fat deposit here in the blood vessel wall, but is not really the disease in the, in the blood vessel wall. And, and all of the drugs, you know, to, that target those risk factors that I, that I mentioned really don't do anything to the blood vessel wall. There are no drugs on the market today that target the primary disease process in the blood vessel wall, zero, okay? So what we need to develop are drugs that will target the primary disease process in the vessel wall and add those on top of the drugs that we have that target the risk factors. Does that make sense? So, um, okay, questions about what is heart disease and the pathophysiology? Those uh, arteries and veins of the heart Line, so if you get a little problem or a problem in one place, it's the whole thing. They or are, are they they're, they're basically three independent uh, parallel circuits. They all hook up at the end, and so if you block one, very lucky individuals can backfill from another one of the uh, uh, par, you know, um, uh, circuits and so can, can, can make up for, for a lot of the loss of circulation through the first one. Uh, so they're, um, they're, they're parallel to a certain extent. Yes, sir, you had a question back here. Yeah, the photo that you showed of the, of the really uh, clogged uh, artery, was, was that from an autopsy? Yes. <coughs> yeah. Is it possible to get a photo like that or anything like that where you can actually see <coughs> Sure, yeah, I mean, uh, we can do an angiogram and put dye down, the, um, down into the coronary artery, you know, through a catheter that's inserted into the groin or the wrist, and go up, snake that catheter up into the heart, and then put the tip into the coronary artery and inject dye. And in that case, you see, you know, you'd see a big, thick band, and then it would narrow down, you know, to a very small area, and then get large again. Most coronary artery disease is, is right proximal, right at the very start of these vessels, right? And so injecting the dye is pretty good. We can also put an, uh, an ultrasound catheter down there that uses ultrasound waves to image how thick the blood vessel wall is. It would be hard to get that catheter through that guy on the right. <laughs> 
but, uh, but that's another way that we can do it. So we can image that today, but, but invasively. Are there tests other than uh, invasive tests in the body to determine if there is ischemia? Functional tests, and so, so you know, classical uh, stress tests. Uh, so that this chap who had, uh, you know, had uh, a quite severe obstruction should have a, a deficit in his in his exercise capacity, or should have uh, pain, you know, when he exercises. And we should be able to replicate that. And we have dyes that we can inject that circulate and are normally taken up by the metabolizing heart, and, and those wouldn't be as well taken up because the blood flow to that region of the heart would, would be uh, d decreased. And so, yeah, there are, so we can, we can do exercise and look for changes both in exercise capacity and in electrocardiogram, and we can do imaging by injecting these tracer compounds that won't be taken up normally. Are the stress tests very uh, reliable? Not as reliable as we would like. Not as good as we would like. Half of everybody who presents with heart disease presents dead. And there's, there are non-invasive IMT tests as well, right? Is, is that what's useful? Or? Carotid, uh, you're talking about the measuring the amount of buildup in the carotid arteries? Uh, the, the media. Thickness, right. Uh, in, uh, in, you mean in the carotid circulation? I mean, it's, it's usually, usually measured in the carotid circulation because those vessels are right underneath the skin, and so it's very easy. And so those, on a population scale, um, correlate with your risk or the risk of the population of having coronary disease, uh, and they are, tend to be decreased if you, if you use interventional treatment. But on an individual basis, if you get stepping back into the clinical, the doctor's office, they're not very helpful. Is there a functional difference between the type of heart attack that typically uh, hits someone, say, in their 40s and one that hits them in their 70s or 80s? Well, um, being a geneticist, I would say it's, it's more likely that the person who has an ischemic event early in their life has a burden of, of genetic variation that predisposes them to that. I mean, the, an individual, say, in their 70s, it's not so surprising. They've had multiple decades of, of risk factor uh, exposure, right? And so perhaps they've had high blood pressure. Perhaps they've, I know they've had a bad diet, you know, if they're in the Western world, you know. They, uh, so so uh, in that respect, I think we usually think that those people would have a difference in, in, the, in the risk factor balance that, that created their, their problem. One word, the fellow in blue. Are there That's a difficult question. That's a difficult question. I said to ask you tough questions. <laughs> uh, you know, um, there's a uh, you know there's a lot of you know uh, quasi science out there. You know, um, I'm not convinced that that I'm not doing anything to reduce my chances of having that. You know, uh, other than exercising, and so I don't think there's I don't think there's a way for us to do that yet, yet. Okay, one last profound question. Yes, sir. <laughs> Can you comment on some of the biomarkers in your previous slides? What they are like? So, so right. So, uh, so the disease process is carrying on the blood vessel wall. So, so I've told you that half of the people who present with heart disease present dead. Okay, we're not doing a very good job. Okay, so. Um, so the, the goal is to, is, to, is to develop biomarkers that will allow us to identify those people who are at risk so we can detect them much sooner, right? And so those, those were names of, of molecules that have been implicated in the disease process before the modern genetics, you know, using animal models and classical biochemical techniques. None of them are great, I can tell you. A dozen of them simultaneously measured is not great. They just don't work as, they work on a population basis, but they don't work on an individual patient basis. Okay, let's go on and we'll have more chance to answer questions later. So risks we, we, uh, we haven't identified and, uh, and those are mostly genetic, we think. So nurture, we've talked a lot, we've talked about the classical risk factors, uh, nurture. I mean, uh, it's all about your glucose and uh, your lipid level. <laughs> Some of us have a bad habit of going to uh, places like McDonald's. Others of us have a bad habit of smoking. So these are well known and well characterized. Um, I don't know where that is. Uh, 
but, uh, but nature also has a very big role, and, and nature, of course, in this case, is genetics. So it's probably fitting that it was around the time that I was born, and probably a number of you were born in the 1950s, that Watson and Crick uh, solved the riddle of the structure of DNA. And they published this, their, their findings uh, in a one-page paper in Nature, a very beautiful, elegant paper I, I urge you all to read at some point. Um, and got the Nobel Prize for that one page, one paper in, in, uh, in Nature. Um, and so this, for me, really was the beginning. I mean, there had been lots of experiments looking at transfer of, of heritability, heritability factors, but this was really, this really opened the door to molecular genetics and allowed us really to start making some significant advances. Um, and then again, uh, the code was cracked here. I like this title in the New York Times. And this was about 50 years later in the year 2000. And so two individuals had been sequenced, right? And, and, so, and so there was both a public and a private effort. And, uh, and, and this, was, this was truly a breakthrough. But these were, these were, these were two sequences of two humans. And, and didn't, they taught us a bit, you know, but they didn't teach us about <coughs> variation in the human genome. And it's really the variation that we really need to try and understand because we want to know, you know why one person is at risk and the other person is, is at risk, or why some guys have a lot of hair and I have almost no hair. You know? So I like this cartoon. The angel says, God, the human genome code's been unraveled. And God says, damn hackers, now I have to change the password. So, so I hope the password is not changed because we're beginning to make some progress. So, so some of you are just going to be completely bored by this, but some of you may find it interesting. So I'll give you a little bit of an in insight into what the, uh, the human genome looks like. So basically DNA, the, the, the chemical DNA is, is made up of four bases, or, which are abbreviated with four letters, G, A, T, and C. And that, those actually make up the basic code uh, of, uh, of the genetic information in the body. There are three billion base pairs. Now, that may sound like a lot. You know, but when you think about what's encoded in those three billion base pairs, it's, I think, a miracle that, that how we look and act and, and how different species look different and act different and, you know, and have, we all have different attitudes and behaviors and, and appearance. I think that all of that being encoded in three billion base pairs is really interesting. 20, so the, the three billion base pairs are divided up between 22 pairs of autosomal chromosomes and, and an X and Y chromosome. Only about a half of 1% of the genome actually encodes protein. And that, that was one of the biggest, I think, uh, surprises when we looked at the human genome for the first time. 23,000 protein coding genes. And then we, as we sequenced lower organisms, it was really embarrassing that the fly also has 23,000 protein coding <laughs> genes. There's only 1% difference between humans and chimpanzees. And we can talk more about this, but that was really, I think that was a staggering uh, observation for, for this, in my estimation. And there's only 0.1% difference between humans, so 3 million base pairs. Look around the room. Look how different we all look, how, how we all have different you know, likes and dislikes, and we'll have different diseases, and, and, and it's all on the basis of three, three million base pairs, because that's all that we are, that's the only difference between us, right, is this, you know, this coding. To date, 3,000, over 3,800 different species, different organisms have had their genome sequenced. So here's what the chromosomes look like. Some are big, some are not so big, some are, you know, have the centromere at near one tip, some have it in the middle, but there they are, and here's how the information is packaged up in these, in these chromosomes. And the chromosome, uh, of course, is a double helix for the DNA. You can see the bases in here, the guanine, thymine, cytosine, and adenine, and the two phosphodiester backbones wrap around these, uh, these base pairs. And, and that really is the stuff of DNA. And this gets replicated, it gets passed on to your children, and this is the stuff that dictates what we are. And so the workhorse of the body is, is the protein, right? And so protein structure, at least the primary structure, the sequence of proteins is totally comes from the DNA. And so, um, and so here we're looking at uh, the, 
the protein-making engine of the body. This is a, a ribosome sitting here on an RNA molecule. This RNA molecule comes, is transcribed off the DNA. It, in, it encodes the same sequence that's found in the DNA, but, but now this you know, molecule is sitting out in the cytoplasm of the cell, and the ribosome is binding to it and making protein, okay? So three nucleotides specify one amino acid and form the codon. So three nucleotides, amino acid one, amino acid two, amino acid three. This guy's going along now. He's crawling along this RNA, and he's making this, this protein. And so you can see up here the amino acids are lining up to make this protein. The amino acids are being brought in by this transfer RNA. He's got a code on him, too. And so he binds here and, uh, and matches up you know, base pair to base pair with this region here. And so the transfer RNA that brings in the amino acid is dictated by the codon, anticodon on him and the codon on the RNA. So this is the process by which the, the, the gene sequence gets trans, um, transcribed into an RNA. And then the RNA dictates how the protein is made. And that, my friends, is how the body works. The proteins then go on to do the work that, uh, that is the basis for all types of functions in living cells. But, um, but not everyone has the same code. Not everyone has the same code in their genes, and so we find differences. And so a lot of, we spend all of our time really trying to find those differences and trying to correlate those differences to differences in risk for disease, differences in height, differences in amount of hair, whatever. And so here you have two chromosomes in this cell, and one of them uh, has a mutation. So this guy here has a mutation. And so, um, so, if, so you have the two strands of uh, the double helix here and two over here, so the two chromosomes are here. And this uh, codon specifies a serine amino acid here and a leucine here. And so this change at this single base pair, right, this single base pair change is called a single nucleotide polymorphism, or a SNP in the vernacular. And so a serine is a, has a hydroxyl group and is a very polar amino acid. Leucine is, a very, is, is not polar. So you could imagine that this single base pair change in the genome could change the function of the protein that, that uh, contains these amino acids. And so, for instance, this could give someone cystic fibrosis, sickle cell disease, right? So this single change of a single base pair out of three billion can give you a human genetic disease that's inherited. And you can track, you, we have assays that we can identify who has this, this single base pair change versus the normal one. We can track them through families, right? And we can track them in, in a cross-sectional fashion between populations as well. So this, we can track these so-called variants, these SNPs, very easily. And we can associate this variation with human disease. And so here's, here's the experimental design for the study that one does. It's very, very complicated. You get a bunch of people without heart disease. They have normal looking hearts. And you get a bunch of people with heart disease who have a broken heart. And so you then associate, right, the chi-square test, you associate your allelic variation, your SNPs, with who has the disease and who doesn't. A very, very simple test, right? Very simple. And that's how the original tests were done. That's how the original discoveries were done for all of the classical risk factors. And so now these single base pair changes in the genome become risk factors, right? Does that make sense? Very simple. Do these guys have that defect that I mentioned, or do they not? Is that defect enriched in this group of humans with, with disease? So a very simple, and these are called, this is called an association study. Association because it doesn't prove anything. It's just an association, right? And it's case control because you have all these cases and you have all these controls. So what can we hope to learn from genetics? Half of the risk of heart disease is genetic, okay? So I've told you about the classical risk factors. We can treat them pretty well. But really, a big chunk of the risk is genetic in nature. And why haven't you heard about this? Because nobody has, it, has a way to measure it. And so there's not been any attention given to this in a doctor's office because he couldn't measure it. He couldn't identify the genetic risk. We could not only have a better idea of risk. And, and so by the way, so I must say that a lot of my colleagues don't think it matters, that we could, doesn't, it wouldn't really be worth very much if we could assess risk or not. 
But I mean, honestly, we could do a lot for people if we could assess risk because, because there are a lot of people out there that have you know, pretty high lipids that don't get treated or don't get treated effectively, uh, you know, don't exercise you know, way too much, and we could do a lot for those people if we knew they were the group that we should go after, right? So, there's, so I think risk, risk assessment is really critical. And we would have better targets for drug development. Currently, as I said, all drugs are aimed at risk factors. We need new drugs targeted against the vessel wall. OK. Any questions about that part? Yes, ma'am. So even if you don't know the exact genes that are involved, um, a decent amount is known about the biology of the atherosclerosis in the vessel wall. So aren't, why couldn't you simply be working on targets to that regardless of knowing the genetics? Um, Tom, can you repeat the question? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. So, uh, so, so you're saying, so we know a lot about the molecules that are involved in the, in the pathophysiology in the vessel wall, and so why don't we just develop uh, drugs to target those? Well, the answer to that is we don't really know, right? I mean, so we can show that the genes you know, are upregulated or downregulated, you know, but does that mean that that's causative in the blood vessel wall? So to date, no single you know, pharmaceutical firm has been willing to take that gamble. So there have been no studies. I mean, we can point to a lot of things. We can knock out the gene in, uh, in mouse, and we can say that mouse has greater or lesser propensity to develop the disease. But is that, the mouse is really very different than the human. You know? So LDL cholesterol carries most of the cholesterol in humans. HDL cholesterol carries most, you know, the particles carry most of the cholesterol in mouse. So, People, you know, so it's a big gamble, and it's a billion-dollar gamble, you know. So people have not been willing to take that gamble until now. Um, yes? You mentioned that uh, among humans, there's a 10% difference on average. But I'm a little bit confused. You're talking then about these SNPs that are associated with disease. Is that 10% include those, or were you talking about a prototypical disease-free human population when you said there was a tenth percent difference? There's a tenth of a percent difference uh, in a random population, random population. And so some of those differences will confer a difference in hair color, eye color, height. Some of those will confer a difference in risk for cancer. Some of those will confer a difference in your risk for other diseases. But they, they come in groups, right, of the things that, that determine hair color, for example. It's not just one snip that Correct. hair color. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Is it only the fraction that codes the proteins in that template? You know, that actually no. The mostly they don't. They, they, mostly they don't code for proteins. Yeah. Pardon? Oh, I'm sorry. So are the SNPs that are different between humans, are they in the coding region of the genes? And the answer is no. They, tend, they just tend to be random. Random. Other questions before we go on? OK. So things began to change in 2003. And people uh, came together, you know, geneticists around the world came together to begin the haplotype project, the, the haplotype map. And this was a, an effort uh, to characterize the variation in different racial ethnic groups. It turns out that when we migrated out of Africa, all humans you know, derived from individuals who migrated out of Africa, uh, we all segregated and went on to, to create our own genetic variation that's quite specific for our own racial ethnic group, right? So there are the Euro Europeans. Uh, the West Africans or Yorubans, the Han Chinese and the Japanese. And so as a first pass, the goal was to map uh, the allelic variation, to map these SNPs throughout the genome for these four racial ethnic groups. And then that would allow us, now that we know, once we have a catalog of the variation, we can do a really good job of associating that variation with human disease. Does that make sense? But before, we only had two, we only had sequence of two humans. And so they were pretty much the same. And so we didn't really have an idea of what is the map of all human 
genetic variation. So this was an extremely important project. It began in 2003. In 2007, there were 3 million SNPs that had been identified, 3 million of those single base pair variants I told you about. Today, there are about 10 million of these single nucleotide variations. And so we can pinpoint now, we can pinpoint a region of the genome very accurately uh, by, by uh, genotyping, by high density genotyping. And so there were a couple of clever guys uh, in the Bay Area who said, okay, I'm gonna make it possible to scan the entire human genome in one quick experiment, okay? So they created chips, these are gene chips, and these are not you know, the Intel microcircuits, these are, these are chips which contain small fragments of genes and allow you, you know, to investigate which allele is present, which of those two base pairs is present at a million to 1.5 million regions throughout the human genome. So you can track now the entire area of all of those 46 chromosomes you can keep track of and you can now associate not you know, your blood pressure and not your cholesterol level, but you can associate which of those two base pairs you have at these loci with human disease, okay? So this is a new, new era, a new day. And this was, these were invented just a few years ago. So this now allows us to do an interesting experiment. This allows us to do a so-called genome-wide association study. We're gonna look at the entire genome. We're gonna do that association study where we take a bunch of humans with disease and a bunch without disease. We're gonna scan their genomes at high density and we're gonna say, okay, which of those single base pair changes seem to track with disease, okay? The big theory that came out five or six years ago, the common polymorphisms contribute to the susceptibility to complex human disease. This was the common disease, common variant hypothesis. Coronary heart disease is common in this population. So we think that the bad genes are actually in all of us and that it's a, it's a, it's a combination of those bad genes and it's a, a bad combination of specific genes or it's a combination of a lot of genes that make one individual at risk versus another individual. So this is a famous hypothesis, the common disease, common variant hypothesis. It assumes that the complex disease originated before humans migrated out of Africa, because these are old, right? For them to be at such a high frequency in the population, they must be old. And we know that, the, that mummies have atherosclerosis, we know that. So, this, so atherosclerosis is an old disease. These are common SNPs, they're very old. And so the, the question is, is which of these is, is associated with human disease? We expected that 10 or 20 genes or variants would be found. And again, the point of all this is to find genetic, is to define genetic risk and find targets for better therapeutic development. So here we are in 2005, okay? So this is before the GWAS era, before we did all of these scans. And we were taking pot shots at the genome. We were saying, okay, I think this gene is associated with disease. And so we'd check it, right? One single, one single variant or one single gene. And so we'd done hundreds of studies, but they were all wrong. And so here in 2005, there was only one association that had been found. This is the APOE gene associated with Alzheimer's disease. And so this is 2005, so keep this in your mind. So here's today, okay? So each spot is a, is a, is a single, genetic study that has implicated a region of the genome with a human disease beyond a shadow of a doubt, okay? So this gene is associated with the disease, right? And, and there is no way that this is a mistake. The data is lock solid. The, the, all of the data and all of these studies has been replicated in multiple populations. And so this, these are real findings. So 1,450 uh, associations have been found since that 2005 picture that I showed you. So this to me is one of the greatest breakthroughs in modern, modern science and modern medicine. So now we can begin to say, okay, there are 30 new genes for ulcerative colitis. There are actually 30 new genes for coronary heart disease. So now we can begin to say, okay, we can actually study the genes that are involved in the disease pathophysiological process. I mean, these are not genes that are there as bystanders, okay? We know that because if we change a single base pair in one of these sites, a single base pair out of three billion, it changes your risk for having coronary heart disease, right? So these are real, There's, these are real. We have to go on and we have to, we have to do a bunch of studies to prove that, to find exactly which gene, to, to show what's the mechanism by how that gene works. But, but this, for the first time, gives us 
something to work with, right? We have been rehearsing for the last few decades to get to this point. So here are lists of the genes and, and traits, human traits that have been mapped. Psoriasis, prostate cancer, what? Polycystic ovary syndrome, longevity, lung cancer, eye color, esophageal cancer, blood pressure, bone density, breast cancer. So this, this is an amazing opportunity now for us. This is an amazing opportunity. And um, I think it cannot be oversold. And so the important thing for us in, in, in uh, ischemic heart disease is, is, that, uh, is that we've not had any genes for us to work on. The cancer guys have had it all, right? <laughs> Retinoblastoma, you know? I mean, they've had cancer genes for a long time. We've had no, no ischemic heart disease genes in the blood vessel wall that we could use you know, to study this disease process. So this was our chance, right? I mean, it was, my, it was my biggest nightmare that we would scan the human genome and we'd come up with a lipid gene, you know? That was like my biggest fear. But it, this was our first chance, really, and our, first, and our best chance to find those genes that's in the blood vessel wall somewhere, you know, in the endothelium, in the smooth muscle cells, somehow these genes that are affecting the primary disease process. Okay, questions up to this point? Okay, in the back. How many uh, people have had their genomes done now? Okay, we'll, we'll, I'll give you some of that information. So the question was how many people have had their genomes done? Uh, uh, in, in this fashion, which is high-density genotyping, uh, we'll come, I'll show you some of that. So I'll answer that question in a few minutes. Yes, sir. Wait, don't watch species. Is it mutation in one of the chromosomes or is it? So, uh, so each, of those, each of those dots right. was, was a single base pair change. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, uh, was uh, I'm sorry, repeat the question. <laughs> Right. In one pair, there was a variation. Right. Is, is, but if both of them have the same variation, then will it be called as SNP or it's not? Oh, it's still is okay. So the question is, is if 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 you have what we 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 call the the minor allele or the or the disease allele uh, on both on both chromosomes, is that uh, is that still a SNP? And the answer, yes, it is a SNP. It's uh it's your homozygous. You have two hits. You have two hits for the bad gene instead of just one. So that's doubly worse. And so we, count, we actually count the number of, alley, number of those bad SNPs you have. And that's how we do the analysis. Can you give me a definition of what exactly is a gene, how many SNPs, and what is a haplotype? No, can't give you that definition. That's that, so what's a gene, and what's a haplotype, and what's a SNP? Or how many SNPs, and how big is the gene? Um, it depends on how you define gene. If you define gene by the exons that code the protein, then that's pretty simple, right? Um, but, th but the size of a gene varies from one kilobase to tens of thousands of kilobases. And then, and then the, the, vari the, the regions which regulate expression of that gene are often thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of base pairs away, right? So genes, so gene, and, and sometimes you'll see many genes all in a row, and they will share, you know, common elements of regulation. And so it's, so I, I wasn't being flip. I, it's very hard to define, you know, what is, how big is a gene. And, and so variation in different loci varies in terms of the quantity, how much variation. There's a lot of variation in some loci, hot spots, and some have almost none. And so we don't really understand why. And haplotype? A haplotype is, is a way of cataloging the association. So what is a haplotype is a question. So a haplotype is a way of, of, of <coughs> cataloging the, the variations that go along with each other. Okay? So let's say you have five SNPs in a row, right? So you have two possibilities here, two possibilities here, two possibilities here, two possibilities here. Then okay, you can have this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy. You can have this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy. So you can have in one region of the genome, you could have five haplotypes, five different flavors of that region of the genome, okay? That's a haplotype. There are a lot of uh, Icelandic names there. 
Iceland being steady because of the Yeah. So Kerry Stephenson. Uh, Kerry Stephenson uh, had this idea to, uh, to study the, the Icelandic population a few years ago. And so he went, his, so he trained here, he trained at the University of Chicago with me when I was there. And then he went to Harvard and studied genetics at Harvard. And, uh, and then he had this idea to go back to Iceland because of the um, relationship, you know, because of the incredible medical records in Iceland, the relationships with the people. And he said, I'm gonna sign up everybody in the country of, of, of Iceland, and he, and he did. And, uh, and he's been using uh, those people and that information to map human disease. Hugely successful effort in Iceland, yeah. So that's one of these, these papers, yeah. Okay, so question in the back. <coughs> The role of the epigenome in uh, in, regula in in cardiovascular disease. Its relationship to disease. Uh, you know, um, so the epigenome and its relationship to cardiovascular disease. So um, that is a that is a tough question. I mean, there there are some obvious links to the epigenome, uh, but but we're just not as far along. I mean, it's going to be involved. I can tell you that for sure. And what size, how much of the puzzle it's going to contribute, I can't tell you. Um, but it's definitely going to be involved because a lot of the <coughs> genes that we are mapping are highly regulated at the epigenetic level, absolutely. The two genes I study are both regulated at the epigenetic level. And so that's where the environment comes in. And the environment can work through ep the epige you know, epigenetics to, to, to modulate gene expression. So, okay, let's go on. And so I want to just... Um, so, so here, you know, in 2007, my dreams finally came true. There were three studies, large studies. I had no role in any of them, and uh, that mapped the first bona fide association uh, with a, a genetic region of, with coronary, for coronary heart disease. So let me just tell you about one of those hits. It's called 9P21. Uh, I mean, so the, the main hit that those papers found was, was, a, was a, a hit called 9P21.3. <clears throat> so it's on chromosome 9. It's on the small arm. Of, of chromosome 9, and it was found to be associated with, with uh, myocardial infarction. And uh, what was really interesting is that it was not associated with known risk factors. So this is not a lipid gene. Okay, this is a gene which is not blood pressure related, not diabetes related. It's related to the blood vessel wall. So this was really exactly what I was hoping to find in, in these kinds of genetic studies. So it correlated with myocardial infarction. So many studies followed these three studies, and, and I'm just going to summarize those for you here. So it correlated with myocardial infarction, the burden of vascular disease as measured using uh, imaging studies, for instance, correlated to peripheral arterial disease, you know, disease in the legs, which limits one's ability to walk, abdominal aortic aneurysm, so in the large vessel that carries blood you know, through the, through the uh, abdomen. Uh, sometimes uh, older folks have an enlargement, that, and those, those can rupture. Very, very common in the, in the American population. So structural abnormalities in the brain, uh, in aneurysms in the brain, very aneurysms, the incidence of stroke, incidence of congestive heart failure, arrhythmic cardiac death. I know you've heard about uh, arrhythmias. So all of these, all of these cardiovascular-like things were, were associated with variation in the 9P21 locus. And this was replicated in our labs and others in East Asians and Hispanics. Because of the socioeconomic differences, you know, people have different kinds of, um, of variation contributing to disease, but this one was so strong it was present in, in, in other racial ethnic groups as well. And the story doesn't stop there because nearby variation, which was just down the street from that variation, was also associated with type 2 diabetes, the second largest hit in the genome for type 2 diabetes, right there, a few hundred base pairs from those variants that were associated with all of those vascular diseases. Multiple cancers, it's estimated that half of all cancers have have, uh, have changes in this region of the genome as well. Frailty in, in older people <coughs> associates with variation in this region of the genome. So this is a hot spot. This is a definite hot spot in the genome where there are genes located that control very basic fundamental processes that regulate all kinds of vascular diseases, which, some of which were never thought to be related to each other. No one ever thought a structural barrier aneurysm in the brain would be related to a myocardial infarction. They just look like completely different diseases. But all of a sudden, there's some common biology now that, that we can study and we can try and understand, and cancer, um, so, and diabetes. All of major, major complex human diseases uh, being associated with that locus. 
Uh, in this case, so these are all, it's, it's several SNPs, but they're close to each other. And so, you know, locus is a crude term, but it, it means a region. It means a region of the genome. Um, yeah. And so, so then we all began to get really serious because it was clear that this was going to work. It was going to work on a big scale, and we had the opportunity now to do something that would really set the stage for, for, for much greater understanding in complex human disease. And so around the world, scientists began to, to, to congregate, began to hook up, began to collaborate. And uh, so this is one study that we were part of. And it's called Cardiogram. I don't remember what, what Cardiogram stands for. but. But the bottom line is you have groups, um, you have our group here somewhere at Stanford. I can't see it right now. But uh, Decode Genetics from, from Iceland, of course. The German MI family study. Uh, Ottawa, the Canadian group. Um, oh, here's my group here, the advanced study. Um, and then you have the MI gen study from Harvard. So 22,000 individuals with myocardial infarction in this study and 65,000 individuals as controls who had no myocardial infarction. It's a massive genetic study. So we combine the data from all of these studies, all these individual studies with their own principal investigator, their own data set, all got combined in one massive computer. And, uh, and we did the association study now using one to one, actually we used three million SNPs throughout the human genome. And so here's what we got. So, so here's what we got. So in this graph, okay, so on the x-axis is the entire complement of human genetic data, okay? So from chromosome 1 to chromosome 22. They alternate black and gray and black and gray and black and gray. On the y-axis is the negative log to base 10 of the p-value, okay? P-value meaning significance, right? And so this gray line, anything above this gray line, indicates a significant finding that, that absolutely can be replicated and is absolutely real. And so what you see is um, some old things that we found that had been found just in the year or so previous to this study, and those are in red, and then new findings that we found in the cardiogram study that are in blue. And so here are the names, or these are the, the gene symbols for genes which came out of this study. and. Um, 30, I think 30 genes, like 25, something like that at this point in time. We've gone on to, have a, to find another 30 genes uh, in the last couple of months. But here's a transcription factor, so a, a master regulator transcription factor that actually is, 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 is expressed in the developing coronary circulation in the very early embryo, very early embryo. So it, it regulates the, uh, the patterning of the coronary vessels in, in, the, in the embryo around the heart. And so we're studying now, trying to figure out how that process, uh, you know, puts a person at risk, or how this changing, decreasing the expression of this gene puts you at higher risk in later life, probably because it somehow alters the, the structure of the blood vessel wall itself. CXCL12 is a is a chemokine. It's an inflammatory mediator, and it's uh, it's somehow involved in the in trafficking bringing the, uh, the leukocytes into the blood vessel wall to, to mediate the inflammatory process. Um, so each of these, collagen 4A1 and collagen 4A2, are two genes which are known to be related to stroke at a very early age. And now it's, they've been linked to, um, to, uh, to myocardial infarction. They're involved in, in, the, uh, in the matrix in the blood vessel wall. They, they're, they're an essential component of the matrix in the blood vessel wall. This gene here. Nothing is known about it. Nothing is known about this gene. There's no paper in the literature, zero papers in the literature about that gene. So we have so much now that we can begin to study, that we can begin to work on, uh, that we can make progress. So all of these genes you know, are, are significant and, and uh, have been replicated now in follow-up studies in multiple racial ethnic groups. So this, to me, represents really the biggest breakthrough for cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease in a long, long time. So we'll take some questions now. Yes? What's the one, what are the one at the top there? 9P21. This is the one I've been telling you about. Oh, okay. This is where diabetes, cancer, frailty, congestive heart failure, peripheral vascular disease, abdominal aortic aneurysm, they all map to that region. So this is the, the p-value here is uh, 10 to the minus 35 or something like that. <laughs> so that's a real finding. Other questions right now? Which one surprised you? Uh, so this gene surprised me the most. So, um, so this gene, I actually cloned 15 years ago. 
And when I was at, so what gene surprised me the most, the lady asked. And so this gene surprised me the most because I cloned it 15 years ago when I was at Vanderbilt and I stopped working on it because I didn't know it was if it was important or not, you know? And so I said, well, you know, there are lots of other genes and I don't know if this one's important, so I'll just quit working on it. And so when this data came out and I was looking at it on my computer screen, I saw, I saw you know, on the computer, I saw my name, you know, in my publications. I was like, that's my <laughs> gene, you know? <laughs> So, uh, so this one surprised me the most, but, but it all makes sense now, and I should have continued to study it, but, but, but that's why this is so important, because now I know that gene is critical, and I know it's worth my time and energy. I didn't know that before, right? Yes? You know, when, for years and years and years, when you'd go to the doctor, they'd ask you uh, questions about your parents and your grandparents. In a sense, doesn't this just now give us an idea of the methodology of why that's important? We've really always noticed that all this happens in families. Right. This is it. This is why. <laughs> this is why. I mean, that's right. That's right. And so, you know, it's a common disease in this country. In some cases, it's, it's primarily genetic. In some cases, it's because people smoke and they have diabetes and stuff. And so, so, um, so, so it's complicated. But, but yeah, I mean, uh, this is exactly, this is it. This is why family history is so important. We looked at individuals, okay, were we looking at their, at snippets of their genome or were we looking at their complete genome? Yeah. So we were looking at those individual polymorphisms, except we were looking at a lot of them. We were looking at three million of them, okay? We weren't sequencing every single base pair. We were looking at, so out of three billion base pairs, we looked at three million base pairs, okay? And so for our purposes, we didn't need to know every single base pair. Yes, ma'am. That one? Yes. Is that, so you're asking me, I'm sorry, what's the question? DNA? Yes, it is. And is it close to your gene, and what, how do they interact? I mean, yeah, I don't know if they're, so is it, is it, so it's close to my gene, and do they interact? And, and I, don't, I don't know if they do. I mean, it looks close here, but this is three billion base pairs long, okay? <laughs> so, so, so they're pretty far away. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer. Okay, one last question, if anyone has one. And, okay, yes. So, They're doing less, um, and we'll talk about them in a minute. Okay. Well, so the question was, I always forget the answer. So the question was 23 and Me. what are they doing? Are they doing three million base pairs? Are they doing 10 base pairs? And so we'll talk about that in a little bit. So we've entered now what I call the metaphase of the GWAS phenomenon, and metaphase is obviously a joke. It's based on the metaphase you know, um, of the uh, cell cycle. But uh, so the cardiogram study I've told you about, Giant, we're part of Giant. The uh, genetic investigation of anthropometric traits, 250,000 subjects in this study were part of the Global Lipids Consortium, uh, 110,000, I think they're up to 200 or 250,000 subjects now. We've already found 90 loci, 90 regions of the human genome that regulate you know, uh, high density li uh, lipoprotein uh, cholesterol levels or LDL cholesterol levels. Um, so this is, this is a major, a major, uh, a major amount of information for drug companies who want to develop new drugs to regulate lipid levels. Diabetes, gen, uh, studies of diabetes, studies of insulin and glucose. We were part of the Tobacco and Genetics Consortium. Really interesting um, findings of, of the nicotine receptor regulating, you know, uh, uh, whether people are interested in, in smoking or not. So some really Huge studies, very nice uh, results, unprecedented collaboration among uh, genetics investigators. So, uh, and so, the, and so, I just want to give you a quick bird's eye view of an estimated heritability. So, schizophrenia is very heritable, autism, height, type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease. So, the question you have to be wondering in the back of your mind is okay, have we explained the heritability? Have we explained this heritability based on what we've found so far? And the answer is no, we really haven't. And so this was a poster from, uh, from Nature Genetics, I think a few, uh, couple, two years ago, uh, saying that, you know, we've done all this scanning, but we've not, we've not explained all of the heritability that we estimated before, right? So here's the bandit, he's, he's getting away with the heritability out the window, and, and these two people are very shocked. So there was a lot of concern, and there were a lot of editorials in the, in the lay press and in the scientific press. 
you know, that, that these genetic studies are a waste of time because we really haven't accounted for all the heritability. And, um, and so someone coined the term genetic, genetic dark matter, and of course this is not genetics, this is the sombrero galaxy, I think, and, uh, but it was just a pretty picture, and I really like the term genetic dark matter because here we have the same situation. We, we know it's there, and we know that there, there's some genetic contribution, but we've not been able to find it yet, and so why, why not? And so uh, to give you a sense of, this slide's out of date. Um, yeah, it's quite out of date. But you know, for diseases like age-related macular degeneration, we can explain 50% of the heritability. That's pretty good, right? Crohn's disease is up to about 40 or 50% now. But uh, early onset myocardial infarction, we could explain about 10% of the known attributable risk um, uh, for, for, uh, of the genetic risk. So, so not so much. But this is changing now. And I just had to tell you that this is, was part of the, uh, the landscape of the genome-wide association studies. As, as the studies have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, we have found increasingly more variation, and we can explain a lot more about the, uh, about the basis, genetic basis of the risk. So, so where is the remainder of the risk, and why haven't we found it so far? <clears throat> I think that there are, uh, there are a lot of possibilities. Genes can interact with each other, and so if you have a you know a type, if you have um, one variant in one gene and a, another variant in another gene, that might be worse than having the you know having a different variants in those two genes. So genes can interact with each other, so-called gene by gene interactions, and we don't actually have the computer capacity to do that experiment just yet, but we're getting there. The gene environment interactions, and I think here's where the epigenome comes in comes into play because the environment will regulate the expression and function of individual genes. We think that there are likely many more small, um, rare uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms that we haven't mapped yet in the human genome. These rare SNPs could have very large effects because they're not common in the genome, right? So if someone has them and they're very likely to have a myocardial infarction, it won't be, it won't, you know, uh, we won't see a suppression of that effect. And then large structural abnormalities in the genome could also account for, for some of the genetic, uh, missing genetic variability. So big theory number two is that the remaining heritability is contributed by rare variants, which have a very, you know, one to five percent of the people would carry them. You can only find them by sequencing the entire genome. Um, and these could have a very large effect, though, uh, on individuals who carry them, and, and it would be a much more important predictor of risk. And so. There are lots of sequencing machines around the world grinding through the human genome, trying to find this missing variation. These would be very important for us understanding the biology of the disease process if we can find them. But uh, so far, I haven't been impressed that we found uh, very much using that approach. We also need to do a lot more studies. We need to. Uh, so far, I mean, the studies, when we all come together, right, we all have different kinds of populations, and we all have looked at things, you know, looked at their phenotype very differently. So, so we need now to get much more sophisticated. We need to look at large numbers of humans where we have more data. I mean, for these studies in the cardiogram uh, example that I gave you, we know that they had a myocardial infarction. We know their lipid level and their blood pressure and their age and their gender, and that was it, right? We knew nothing else, and so we need to have more data, and we need to do genetic studies on individuals of much better phenotype than we've had access to previously. So we're getting there. Um, so, and we will begin to do gene by gene, gene by environment interactions. I've talked about that. Um, yeah. So let's let's that's just. Uh, so what did we learn from the large scale human genetic studies? What do we really know? We found numerous. Genes, numerous loci have been identified, providing many complex human diseases, new molecular insights into disease-associated pathways. So scientists like me can go to the laboratory now, go to the lab bench and say, okay, exactly how does this work? It's like a gigantic puzzle. You have a single base pair change somewhere in the genome, and that changes your risk for having this disease. How? How does that work? How does that work? What does it do to the gene? What does that single base, how does that single base pair change the function of the gene? And so that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Although the effect sizes are small for the, for the things we've mapped, that is, we've not been able to find all the variation, all of the uh, attributable risk, the biology is highly relevant. GWAS findings provide a platform for future research into disease mechanisms. And while the biological gains have been huge, 
we must remember that the assignment of genetic risk has not yet achieved what we would hope that it could. And this whole thing, idea of genetic risk was oversold, I think, by my, our colleagues on Sand Hill Road and Page Mill Road. I mean, uh, the, the, the dream was a very good one, you know, that we would have markers that would allow us to assess risk at a, on, a, on a grand scale. So we'd be able to say, okay, if you have this, this base pair of variation and that one and that one and that one, you know, we can, we can now assess 50% of your risk for coronary heart disease. That would be amazing if that was true. It's not gonna be that easy. So 23andMe, DecodeMe, Navigenics, these guys, I, I, know, I know people in all of these companies and, and, and what they've tried to do is interesting and laudable, but, but uh, they just can't uh, account for enough of the risk at this point in time to make it really worthwhile. To, to, to do that assessment, in my estimation. It's not far away. It's a couple years away or something like that, but it just hasn't been here yet. Too little variation has been accounted for. There's limited predictability. I think it's just a bit too early for personalized genomics, although I'm, I'm impressed that, that this is coming soon. And as the price of the human genome is going down, I think today we can get a human genome for $4,000. I think that um, I think it'll soon be time for everyone to have their, their sequence. So I'll just give you, uh, let's have some questions now before we go into what Stanford. Yes, ma'am. So you said that with all these genomics that um, you've done so far that you can perhaps account for 10% of the heritable risk. How big do you know the heritable part of the risk is in the first place so that you think you've got 10% of it? Right, so we, uh, we look at, so how do we know, how do we measure attributable risk? How do we, how do we assess a priori the size of the genetic attributable risk? And we do it by twin studies, so classical epidemiology design. So twin studies, twins, twins reared apart, if possible, right? So we could separate out the environment from the genetic contribution. So that's, and, and you could argue that we, that we miscalculated, <laughs> but, but, but I don't think we did. I think that, I think we're, our calculation was correct, and I think that we just have to do more studies. I mean, you know, I showed you 2005, and I showed you, showed you 2011, you know, 1,500 associations. That ain't bad for five years. Give us a couple more years, and we'll, we'll, we'll find the rest of the risk. Other questions? Yes. Um, so is there something holding back the, the aggregation of data that's required to do these much larger studies? So what is, when you say we need more data, we need larger studies, what, what is the limiting factor? Money, I you know, money and uh, time and money and time and money. I mean, uh, it's just hard to. I mean, um, it's hard to uh, to recruit. Uh, I spent twenty five million dollars recruiting twenty five hundred people in the Bay Area. It's it's expensive, and um, and to phenotype those people, you know, to to do studies in them, to do blood work, to do EKGs, to do x-rays, to do stress tests, to do whatever else you could think of that might give you an insight, uh, do, you know, do, uh, you know, uh, assess their amount of exercise, um, do these, you know, assess, you know, in, in good detail their sensitivity to insulin, for instance. I mean, very expensive, very expensive, and it requires organization on a, on a very large scale. But, but so you're saying it is actually That's, that, that, will be, that will be very, very, very helpful. I mean, if we're looking, if, if there are gene environment interactions, I mean, I've, I've given you the limited data set we have for a cardiogram, right? It's head and MI, age, gender, lipid level, blood pressure, do they smoke? I mean, that was about it. So we have no exposure history at all. And so that's gonna be a big piece of the puzzle. We, we need to get that data somehow. And so I'll tell you in a second, I'll tell you how we're, how we're beginning to think about approaching that, you know, within the confines of our available resources, I guess. Yes, sir. Do all those groups, let's say, in cardiogram, all want to work on the same gene? How do you sort of allocate, you work on this one, I'll work on this one? That's a great question. <laughs> That's a great question. And so when we went into this process, it was a very, it was very, Controversial. I mean, it was very difficult to know how we would all get some piece of the pie. You know what I mean? So the question was, how do we divvy up the, the spoils uh, when we do this kind of study, like cardiogram? We find these 30 genes or whatever. And so the answer is, is that 
most of these guys don't care, you know? They just want to make the association and move on, you know? And so I'm the guy who cares about the mechanism. So, so uh, you know, I, my, I get interested once we get the genes, and they get disinterested once we get the genes. So, so, there's a, so it's a breakdown. And most of the people are human geneticists and, and really don't have a, a, a have a mechanistic kind of bent, or they don't think in mechanistic terms, at least not in terms of test tubes. You know, they don't have, they don't have test tubes on a lab bench to do those kinds of experiments. And so, but, the, but I must say, I cannot, I cannot stress too much how, how wonderful these collaborations have been because the writing groups, you know, it, when you have, so some of these papers have over 200 authors on them. And so there's been huge attention to, okay, who are the young guys? Who are the young guys who have to look out for their career? And so they get, you know, they get the starred first author position, you know, and, and if, you know, and so, and they're in the writing group. And, and so people have really looked out, I mean, the scientists have looked out for the young folks tremendously. I, I've been so, so happy about that. I mean, it's an experience that's made me think of science in a whole different light, I think. So, uh, so it's, there's not been any conflict. Honestly, there's not been any conflict that I've seen, through, despite the large number of scientists who've come together. One last question in the back. So what's the, uh, now the understanding of the mechanism of 9P21? Okay, what's the mechanism of 9P21? So, so, um, so just downstream of those variants that were associated with all of those things, you know, are three genes that are cyclin-dependent. Two of them are cyclin. Two of them are cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors. One of them is a regulator of p53. So these genes regulate basic cell cycle processes, right? Cell division, apoptosis, set programmed cell death. These are genes which regulate fundamental things which a cell has to know how to do on a daily basis. Almost certainly those genes are linked to, uh, to the beta cell in the pancreas that makes insulin, and they're, associated, they're linked to senescence, to, to death of those beta cells in the pancreas. And so almost certainly they're determining that, they're, they're determining that those cells can't continue to divide. They, they grow old too quickly and they die, those, those beta cells that produce insulin. So for cardiovascular disease, for the disease I've been talking about, I think that one and possibly two of those genes regulate the uh, response to injury in the blood vessel wall through regulation of programmed cell death. So the, these are very old, you know, biological, biologically important processes that we've not really associated. Nobody was studying this region of the genome before this association study, I can tell you that, in association with coronary heart disease, no one, you know. Okay, one last question. Um, do you see a day soon when insurance companies will be willing to pay for uh, <laughs> 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 so, so basically, instead of maybe paying for a stress test, they so yeah, I, don't <laughs> so I can repeat it. I can't answer it. But so we'll, well, can we see in the near future that uh, insurance companies will pay for this kind of genome scan and this kind of information, uh, and, and and pay for this rather than a stress test? I mean, so there is a law that was signed into effect under George W. Bush, which prevents the um, the use of genetic information for discriminatory purposes. And so um, I think that that pretty much ends ends the discussion. Uh, you know, it might be that the insurance company could say, well, I don't see how they could, I don't see how they can incorporate into their algorithms genetic information given the, given the way that law is written. So let me just tell you a little bit about what we're doing here at Stanford. We were very fortunate to recruit a few years ago Mike Snyder as a new chair of genetics, and he's providing an amazingly wonderful, he came from Yale, and uh, he's heading, he's chair of genetics, but he also has the Center for Genomics and Personalized Medicine at Stanford. And he's providing a very important bridge between te technical advances in genetics and population studies. He doesn't do population studies, but he has all the methodologies that, that we would want to use in population-based studies, and he's a big advocate of this. Um, he has high throughput sequencing, um, sequencing the whole genome now, not just three million uh, changes in the genome, but the entire, every single base pair. High throughput genotyping. Uh, he has a huge computer cluster for analyzing the genomic data. And so he and I have been involved, involved in something called gene pool. I'll spend a few minutes telling you about gene pool. So you'd ask that, someone had asked the question about how are we gonna get genetic data? 
with better phenotypes. And so there are a lot of people walking around who have great phenotypes, right, who have great phenotypic data. And who are those people? Well, those people are patients in hospitals, right? And so um, we are establishing a partnership with Stanford Hospital to recruit highly phenotyped groups of patients. And we would like to, we're, we're going to ask them if we can obtain genetic data uh, from them and use their genetic data and their phenotypic data, their disease-related uh, condition data, and, and do large-scale genetic studies. So Vanderbilt University is doing this. They've already enrolled 100,000 of their patients into this study in Nashville, Tennessee. Mount Sinai is doing this and has 25,000 New Yorkers enrolled in, in their study in, in, at Mount Sinai. Uh, the Scripps Clinic is doing this in San Diego, and they have I don't know how many thousand people as well. University of Pennsylvania is beginning to do this, and we are partnering up. We're sister, sister sites, gene pool at Stanford, and I can't remember the name of the, the program at the University of Pennsylvania. But if you're a patient at Stanford Hospital, you may get asked at some point to, to be part of this study. And this is a study that's going to be a collaborative effort between, between the patients and the, and the scientists and the physicians. And so the goal is to, uh, to educate people about genetics and, and give them the opportunity to participate in this study and then, to, um, and then to inform them about what the study is doing in terms, of the, in terms of the types of experiments that are being conducted and what we're learning. So this will be an ongoing collaborative discussion back and forth between patients and uh, physicians and scientists. And so if, if, if we find something in the genetics in this study, this information will go back to the patient's physician, and they can then, you know, uh, they can then explore this in more detail. So this is a very unique kind of design um, and a collaborative effort, really, between, we've seen a great collaborative effort between scientists, and this, I think, would be what's needed, this kind of collaborative effort between patients and uh, physicians and researchers to really take us to the next level. Because the budgetary constraints are not going to allow us to do a lot of the things that we would like to do at a population level. We're going to run into that, that problem. So what will uh, Stanford's role be in the genomics and genetics revolution? Well, we'll have partnerships with other research groups such that we've done this and, and others here at Stanford have done it, looking at highly phenotyped cohorts to identify disease-associated variation. We'll develop databases and algorithms for interpreting the genomic data for physicians and patients. I mean, sequencing the human genome is great. It costs $4,000, you know, and takes two months or something like that, you know, to sequence and then call the variation in the genome. But, it, but okay, what do you do then? <laughs> Who's going to look at that sequence and interpret it for you? That's going to be much, much more complicated. And so that's where Stanford is really going to, I think, make a name for itself, is going to be developing the algorithms that are going to allow you know, the human, raw human genetic information to come in one side and then, and, then, uh, and then relevant medical information to come out on the other side. So this is where the world is right now. I mean, we are not there yet. So even if you go to your doctor and you get your whole genome sequenced, who's going to interpret it? That's really the critical issue. High throughput sequencing of highly phenotyped patients will identify rare disease variation. And, and so a lot of progress is being made for, for very rare diseases. So within cardiovascular medicine, we have in the United States the only inherited cardiac disease center. It, it takes care of patients who have Marfan syndrome, which is a genetic defect involving the heart and the, uh, the large blood vessels, uh, the aorta that comes out of the heart. Cardiomyopathies, I think Ewan's already spoken. Ewan runs the, runs the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So people who have a primary disease uh, of the heart muscle tissue, arrhythmias, inherited arrhythmias, and, and then uh, run-of-the-mill complex coronary heart disease risk factor assessment. And we're actually doing a study now to see if, the, if we're randomizing humans in our clinic. So some of them get genetic information and some of them don't, and we're going to measure their risk factors, the risk factor control after several months and see if, if those individuals who've gotten their genetic information do better than those who don't. So it's a start. It's a small study, but it's a start. Um, questions? Yes. Evidently, Kaiser is doing something like your study of asking their patients. Is it the same thing? Very similar. I mean, so Kaiser has always been at the forefront of, uh, 
of, I mean, so there's been, there, there's, a, a, there's, a, there's an organization called the Kaiser Division of Research. And so that DOR is, is essentially like a university and it uses the clinical information of the uh, Kaiser patients and they do lots of, you know, they've done tons of beautiful epidemiology studies over the years. And so now with the contribution of Neil Risch, who actually was a faculty member here for many years, they've, they've gone into the genetic arena as well. And so they're getting tons of genetic information on hundreds, hundreds of thousands of, of, of humans in Kaiser. So they have the, the patient record information and they have the genetic information. So they'll be in a, a wonderful position. But you know, Stanford has its own unique groups of patients as well. So, uh, so but, but that's, a, that's a fabulous effort and you're right, very, very similar. And I think, so, so, so to repeat that question, so um, this is an answer to an insurance company uh, thinking about using genetic information, uh, not in a bad way, but in, so I think they're using it not in a bad way, but a good way, I agree. They wanna, they wanna, they wanna find <coughs> markers of risk, they wanna, they wanna produce new and helpful genetic information. So I think it's a really tremendous. I'm very, I'm very proud of that effort. I mean, I'm not part of it, but I'm just proud to see it happening, you know. Um, yes. What about indirect causality? For example, if there's a genetic uh, predisposition to obesity, and if obesity affects heart disease, would that show up in your study? Um, I mean, you. We should. Um, I mean, th so theoretically, you would map that very. You'd map that gene. You'd map that variation. Uh, but for, 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 a variety, for, for a variety of reasons, um, and if we had extremely sensitive tools, we would see those genes, but we're just not sensitive enough because there's two orders of magnitude. There, there so obesity is a risk factor for insulin resistance, and insulin resistance is a risk factor for coronary heart disease. So we're two steps away from the disease process, and so we just don't have the sensitivity. So it would have to be a gigantic effect on obesity or we would have to have a million people to study, you know, to find that kind of association. Well, I was hoping to talk a bit about um, the one remaining risk factor that has not been studied in the United States and represents the biggest risk in our country um, uh, outside of the genetic risk, and then that's insulin resistance. But uh, I don't know, maybe I'll just take questions or? Uh, five minutes. Five minutes, you wanna hear five minutes about insulin resistance? Yes. Yes. Metabolism? Okay. So people, people have known, so we're shifting gears now. So we're gonna come back to heart disease in a minute, but now we're gonna think metabolism, diabetes, metabolism, okay? So, uh, so type two diabetes, uh, most of you know, is, is uh, several percent, it's less than 10%, it's probably around three to 5% of the uh, American population. That's gonna, that's gonna quadruple in the next few years, okay? There's gonna be an explosion of diabetes. And, and that's gonna be worse in some of the racial ethnic groups. So, di so uh, type two diabetes really is a function of two things, right? And it's a function of loss of the body's ability to respond to, to insulin, and then uh, loss of normal pancreatic function, loss of ability to make, to make, uh, to make insulin. So insulin resistance can be associated with normal uh, beta cell function, and so the beta cells in the pancreas can pump out a lot of insulin, okay? And so you have high insulin levels, so your body compensates, at least for a while. Or if you have abnormal beta cell function, and we talked about the role of 9P21 in this process, um, you, you end up with relative insulin deficiency, right? Your body's resistant to the insulin, you, your pancreas can't make em enough, your blood glucose goes high because the insulin can't take care of all the glucose and you develop type 2 diabetes. So type 2 diabetes is, a very, is probably the most important risk factor for, for heart disease um, uh, that we've known about for a while. But really, the, the, the big piece of the risk is up here. It's, it's the insulin resistance. It's the body's inability to respond to insulin. And so even these guys here, <clears throat> And they have, they're normal glycemic and they're not diabetic, 
but they have high insulin levels, and high insulin levels are detrimental and puts you at risk, even without diabetes. So both sides of this, of this paradigm are a problem, okay? And so 5% of the people in the United States are diabetic and are at risk for developing cardiovascular disease, right? Five, well, it's going to 5%, let's say, 5%. And you think that's going to go to what, 20%? Yeah, I think it's going to go high. But today, this is, I don't know this is 3%, whatever, but this is 25%, okay? 25% of the people in the United States respond poorly to insulin, are insulin resistant. So this, the, the amount of risk that, that sits here is gigantic. And so, so what's upstream of insulin resistance, right? Genes and lifestyle and diet. The same paradigm, right? So 50% of, of your risk for developing insulin resistance is there and there. And so the problem, the, the epidemic in, uh, in obesity and the, you know, the loss of, um, of uh, physical activity in our schools is going to produce a lot of insulin resistant individuals, in part because they're, they're obese, but also because they're, they're not active. And so diabetes is going to go up. Cardiovascular disease is going to go up because of the diabetes, and it's going to go up because of the insulin resistance. So it's going to be a double whammy. So cardiovascular disease is going to be here for a while. So, <laughs> so looking, at, looking at this audience, the variation in the amount of um, insulin response to insulin among all of you is about 600%. It varies six-fold. There's no other biological variable I can think of that has such a dramatic range, right? So those of you who are most able to utilize insulin or most insulin sensitive will have dec very low risk of cancer, low, certain forms of cancer, low risk of diabetes, and low risk of cardiovascular disease. Those individuals who are insulin resistant are at, are at much higher risk for diabetes, certain forms of cancer, polycystic ovary syndrome, and cardiovascular disease. So uh, it's, it's a huge problem, and it's getting huger. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk much more about this. So, um, so insulin sensitivity, 50% roughly, is heritable, right? And so the problem with insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance is you can't measure it in the doctor's office. There's only one way to measure it, and that's to put a person in the hospital, give them IVs, infuse insulin, and infuse glucose simultaneously, and then looking at, the, at the, how high the glucose level goes in association with the amount of insulin that you're giving them. This is a so-called insulin clamp test. And there have only been 4,000 people in the world that have ever been studied in this fashion. So, um, so to try and better define risk, I rounded up all those 4,000 people right, in the world. And, um, and so we are now studying the genetics of this, these humans because, again, this is half of the risk. And so we need to understand that. So we have formed what's called the Genesis Study, the Genetics of Insulin Sensitivity Consortium. We did a genome-wide association study in 2,000 of those people, and we're replicating our findings in the remaining 2,000 people. And here's the results from our study so far. Again, human chromosomes on the x-axis, negative log p-value on the y-axis, and so we've got a few hits up there which reach genome-wide significance. So the goal is to take these variants, try and understand which genes are associated with, and understand what's the mechanism by which those genes regulate the body's sensitivity to insulin. And so I'll leave it at that. So coronary heart disease, genetics is important. We make a lot, we're making a lot of progress. We have a lot more to do. Um, but now at least we have new and interesting pathways we can study in the blood vessel wall to develop new and more effective therapeutics, hopefully. Uh, so I think I feel very good about what we've done for coronary heart disease. This area, the one remaining risk factor that hasn't been approached, hasn't been targeted by effective therapeutics to this point, hard to measure. The risk is immense. It's getting bigger. You know, we're trying our best to use genetics to try and understand what's the mechanism for, for this risk. But this is going to be the big problem going forward, despite all our efforts for, for cardiovascular disease otherwise. Okay, that's the end. Questions?
Okay. Yes. So, I don't know that I understand, but insulin sensitivity, does that mean you have diabetes or you're proclivity towards diabetes? Or? So, right. So, if you, uh, so, so insulin, you know, uh, disposes of glucose. And, um, and so, um, if you have uh, low, if you don't have enough insulin, if, then, you know, you, your glucose goes high and you're diabetic. The problem, the biological problem that, that induces diabetes is that your body becomes resistant to insulin. And so your insulin levels go up, not down, they go up, right? And so that's a risk. So insulin is a potent growth factor and, and does a lot of things in the body at high levels that, that are not good for you. So that's a risk, and that's called insulin resistance. With time, many people's pancreas peters out. It can no longer make enough insulin to, to dispose of glucose effectively, right, because of this resistance. Those people go on to become diabetic. That's going to be 3% to 5% to of the population. But the number of people who are insulin resistant is 25% of the population. So even if you don't have diabetes, but you're insulin resistant, you're at a much higher risk for atherosclerotic disease. Does that make sense? How much of that insulin resistance is lifestyle and how much genetics? 50-50. So how much is lifestyle, how much of the risk is lifestyle, how much of the genetics? 50-50, more or less. I mean, it varies between 40 and 70, you know, depending on who you, who you talk to and who you believe, but, but it's right in that, that ballpark. So, so, um, but we need to know who's at, who has a genetic risk. We can fix the environmental risk, right? I mean, it's not easy. I mean, trying to get someone to lose weight and be active is not easy. But if we could find those people who carry the genetic risk and we could focus on those people, we could make a much, we could make much better progress. Yes. Oh yeah, I mean, there's it's a it's a it's, a, it's an obesity epidemic. I mean, uh, you know, among teenage children. I mean, in certain racial ethnic groups, it's 10 percent. You know, of uh, uh, of high school kids are, are obese, and uh, so so it's obesity and it's lack of activity. Those two go hand in hand, of course. Um, that, so that's going to be that's going to drive the numbers. That's going to drive the numbers. And so it's not true that every obese person is insulin resistant but it increases your risk of being insulin resistant dramatically because, yeah, it just increases your risk. Yes. Is, it, is it the obesity that is the problem or is it the diet that's created the obesity that creates the risk factor? However you create the insulin resistance, so the question is, is who's, what's the fundamental problem, right. Right, right here? Is it the obesity, is it the food? Um, I think, I, so I can't really answer that question, but I can tell you this, and that is it's that biochemical inability to utilize insulin that's the problem. And so whether you have bad genes, or you have a bad diet, or you just like to watch the NBA games on the television, you know, the problem is, is, um, is, is that high level of insulin is a problem. That's a real problem, and, 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 uh, and the inability to utilize insulin. So that's the fundamental biochemical defect. And it's hard to convince the world to, to, that we should study this. You know, I mean, Jerry, so Jerry, this work was begun by Jerry Reven 50 years ago. Jerry Reven is, is a Stanford faculty member emeritus now. But he was laughed at. And, and, we, and, you know, and I, we were laughed at trying to, <clears throat> trying to map these, these human genes. You know, the, world, I mean, the NIH wouldn't fund it. You know, and so we had to find you know, money wherever we could find it, you know, to try and study this. People don't understand it, they don't believe it. So, some of my grants came back and said, well, isn't insulin sensitivity all in the, isn't that just sort of a mental thing, you know? <laughs> I mean, on a, a review of an NIH grant, I mean, it's just unbelievable. So it's been hard to educate the world that this is a gigantic problem. And if we, if we you know, we need, we need to understand the genetics, we need to understand whatever we can understand, but it's that problem, it's the, High insulin, the in, in, insensitivity to insulin, that's the problem, no matter how you get there. And that's probably the biggest problem with diabetes. 
that's probably the biggest problem with diabetes. It's you know high glucose, yeah, that's that's not great for your body, but it's this insulin ins, insulin insensitivity. You know, so you take diabetics as a group, and this is probably the biggest chunk of their risk for atherosclerosis. Someone else, yes, sir. What's a better test are they uh, between a glucose score and an A1C test as to whether somebody has type two or doesn't have? Well, you, you diagnose type 2 diabetes on, on the level of glucose, on a fasting glucose level, you know. If you're diabetic and you measure the hemoglobin A1C, that's a measure of how effective your control is or how ineffective your control is over a longer period of time. So if you have, you know, repeated bouts of increased glucose levels, then your hemoglobin A1C goes up. You know. So, so which, which do you think is more meaningful? Well, the most meaningful thing is your glucose, serum glucose level, because if that's, fasting serum glucose level is high, you're, you're diabetic, and that's, that's the beginning of, well, that's, that's an issue, that's a problem. Yes, sir. So if you're a grandparent, a grandparent on both sides of your parents <coughs> have diabetes, what are the chances that, that you're going to inherit that? <coughs> Uh, so it's going to be higher than if, if neither your parents <laughs> didn't have diabetes. Uh, it's, you know, so, so, right, so you have, so, so the question is, is if both your parents have diabetes, what's the risk that, that your, your grandparents, 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 both your, both, both my grandparents have diabetes. Well, Okay, so two grandparents, so the question is, two grandparents with diabetes, what's your risk as a grandchild for having diabetes? Um, well, you, you remember that, you know, so each person has, has two copies of each chromosome, right? And so those assort, and, and so there have been two assortments of, of genetic information, you know, between them and you, and so your genome is quite different than theirs. But it does put you at a slightly higher risk, I'm sure, you know, than, than, than someone, you know, in a random population. But it's not huge. It's not huge. Thank you, Tom. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.